I was asked if I could do reviews of some of the British World War II masks, so what I'm actually going to do is just talk about the military models in this video. So what I have here is the Mark IV General Service Respirator, quite a famous mask. And these are generally in quite good condition despite how old they are because of the fact they were coated in stocking net. Now, before I get more into the Mark IV, I'll talk about the sort of masks that are precursors to this. So, after pH gas hoods and hypo hoods, in World War I, Britain used masks called the English box respirators. They are called box respirators because they had these kind of canister filters on them. Now, I'm not sure at which point they actually went from being called the box respirators to the uh, GSR, General Service Respirators, but the main British Army masks of World War II with the Mark IV and Mark V GSRs. Now, there's also a Mark III GSR that I've seen pictures of, but it's actually not made with a rubber face piece like all of these. It's made with sort of canvassy stuff that's more like a bag. So again, it looks more like the World War I box respirator kind of designs. So the Mark IV GSR has an exhale valve here. That's not actually a speech diaphragm, although the exhale valve is big enough that it you could probably be heard fairly clearly when talking with it. So you've basically got two things for this mask. You've got your filter intake that comes up through the bottom section here. And then you've got your exhale valve here. So obviously you breathe in through the filter, it would be kept in your satchel. Where I've got it taped up, that's where the intake is, because blue asbestos in the filter, better safe than sorry with something of its age. You'd keep this in your satchel to support the weight of it, and there'd be a hole in the bottom of the satchel bag so you could breathe through it with the filter in the satchel. See there's some tears here in the hose anyway. So it goes up with the hose, you then breathe the clean air in through, and you exhale that. No Tissot tubes or anything like that in this mask, it's quite primitive. You've got your two round eyepieces there, and you've got your straps there. Sort of a standard head harness that these British masks use of the period. Interestingly enough though, it does seem to be a six strap harness rather than the five strap harness. So, there we go. This is the face piece that you're going to be seeing quite a bit of, because all of the British masks used in the army at this point, and the civilian duty mask, have a very similar face piece. They just kind of adapted them in the factories for, you know, logistical reasons that you always have the same mask. But the Mark IVs are preserved fairly well because they had this stocking net coating. If you don't know what stocking net is, it's basically the material bandages are made from. So if you think of what bandages are, coat a gas mask in bandages that are kind of this yellow colour. Uh, the hose as well is coated in stocking net. And then you get what the Mark IV GSR is. So now let's get the Mark V GSR out. Here we have a carry satchel for a Mark V GSR, so I'll unbutton this. So exactly the same filter, it sits in the same place. But what we have here is a rubber hose, rather than the stocking net coated hose. And primarily it's the same mask, just made out of plain rubber, not with um, the stocking net on. But something very interesting to note is that it has um, a microphone input. Now how these worked is basically on the inside of the mask is a hole there and the idea was that you'd have people who were needing to talk um, you know and be heard clearly rather than holding something up to here you'd have a microphone that could be cut into the rubber and inserted and when that microphone was in there you'd still get an airtight seal because obviously the microphone is blocking um, see my finger now pushing against the inside of it microphones blocking air from getting in. It's not really a perfect system, it's why on masks like the S10 now you can see where there's a bit where you can actually clip a microphone directly to the outside of the mask and so if this is an S10 for example what you'd have is a secondary voice diaphragm or exhale valve here and then you'd have a bit where it could clip directly onto the outside so you don't have to penetrate the mask. But it's a fairly clever idea. You'll notice that the civilian duty masks as well also have this same sort of thing on them but this is quite a famous mask, the Mark V GSR. It was used by Canada and Australia as well as the Mark IV. And if you've seen the George Romero film The Crazies, not the remake but the original, they have the Mark V GSR, but where the um, filter hose would be, the hose has been removed, and they've instead got like filters glued or soldered onto the mask like that, more modern filters. As said, all British World War II masks are probably containing asbestos, most are confirmed to contain asbestos, 
but the filters will be so old that it's not going to be safe to breathe through it even if they were just charcoal and paper or cotton filters. In general it's thought that most British World War II filters contained a mix of asbestos and cotton for the particulate layer and used um, activated charcoal as the carbon layer. As I said there's a common misconception most people have where they seem to um, think you only can have asbestos or activated charcoal. No, because one is the particulate filter, one is the carbon filter. They are two separate things. So, there you go. Mark V. Made of rubber, cheaper to make, there's no stocking net coating. And it has the microphone thing. Uh, you think there's one called the Mark IV Special, or something like that, and it's a Mark IV with the same thing on it. But, primarily it was the Mark Vs that had the actual microphone input, as well as the civilian duty masks. Now for the more modern mask that replaced it. I'm sure you've all seen this one before. It's the light anti-gas respirator, and I've actually tested this and it still works. So, again, very similar face piece. You don't have a pipe coming in here because you've got a side-loading filter. No microphone thing on this side either. But the mask is fundamentally the same rubber mould. Now, the idea was that you'd had the previous rubber masks, and it's not that handy having a big filter on it that adds a lot of weight, you know, makes the mask a lot bigger, makes the mask heavier, you know, all those sorts of things and it's not easier to replace the filter when it expires. Obviously a big canister filter is going to last a long time, but what they wanted really was a mask that you could wear and use easier. So this is what the actual light anti-gas respirator did. You've got a mask that's quite lightweight and you can put on fairly easily. I say easily, but it's not. <laughs> there we go, so that's the mask on making an airtight seal, but it took a 60mm filter on the side, more than 60mm filters are fairly safe to use, the old ones not, obviously you need the anti-dim stuff off and on it as I said, because no inner masks, it's already fogging up, but what you essentially had here is a mask that was much lighter, you could change the filters in the field, and it was easier to use a rifle with, assuming you weren't left-handed. If you were left-handed, apparently you had to use the old mask because they hadn't bothered making these of the filter and take on that side till a while later. But, yeah, the light anti-gas respirator was obviously a good step forward, and it's where you get into the sort of modern mask designs you can still see today. A mask that's a uh, fully removable, you know, actual mask, no wires and pipes coming off of it, side-loading filter, you know, all round a good design. Now, obviously, as said, uh, well, I've said before in other videos, not just this one, Britain wasn't the first mask to make a side-loading mask. You have um, the Germans, well, at least not side-loading, but front-loading. The Germans have been doing this since supposedly World War One with the screw filters. Again, I've not personally got one, so I haven't had a chance to play around with a World War One gas mask and confirm it. But certainly by the GM30 and the GM38, as well as um, your, your like civilian masks, the VM masks, they all had you know actual screw-on filters that would go onto the front sort of areas there of the mask. So the Germans had come up with this concept first, but they hadn't really perfected it. The British mask was better because it was on the um, left side. So if you're a right-handed shooter, it's actually you know a better design and having a filter on the front because a lot of people don't like the front-loading filter masks for that reason. But what you basically had after um, this mask came out, the Americans had the M9, which is the same sort of concept, and then you know quite a few other nations started doing this kind of design, or still using bottom things, but the idea of having you have a screw-on filter. This is kind of the turning point where everybody realised screw-on filters is a good idea, rather than using you know permanently attached ones. And even when you look at the Soviet masks of this period, you'll find that. You know, this is where they start going into the 40mm Gost kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, screw-on filters. Even when they're still using the pipes, such as the SHM-1 and the SHM-41, you're still using a screw-on Gost pipe, not a fixed one onto the mask. So the filters are still quick to change. So, there you go. That's the British military masks of World War II. As said, I have done videos on the civilian duty mask, the regular civilian mask, and the Mickey Mouse children's mask. There's also one I don't have, which is like the baby mask where you put them inside it and pump the bellows. 
I think there's a hospital patient mask that's slightly different or similar to that. Again, I don't own them, so I can't say what's the same and what's different. I'm sure some of you owns them in the comments will let me know, they always do. But um, these are the main military masks. As said, there is a Mark III that I don't own, but it's not the rubber face piece that we see in all these masks. What's the best out of these? Well, I like the Mark IV a lot because of the cool stocking neck stuff on it, and um, you know, it's designed, it's not safe to use. I'll see if I can get hold of it to do a video on it, because you might find it interesting, but my friend Bart and I did this thing where he had a Mark IV that was in bad condition, so we safely disposed of the asbestos filter properly by bagging it up and taking it to an asbestos disposal site because it was leaking. And then what we did was we soldered onto the pipe intake a Gost filter intake from a Russian gas mask hose that was damaged. Um, so it can actually take Gost filters. Now you probably think this is some sort of horrible Frankenstein mask and how dare we do it to historical masks. But as I said, most of it was damaged. So you could either have a damaged mask leaking asbestos or you could safely dispose of the asbestos filter and convert it to actually take modern filters, sort of, because it's Gost. So if he can find it, because I have no idea what he's done with it, um, I will try and do a video on that where I can load a modern Polish ABEC filter on and then uh, test out a uh, Mark IV gas mask with a modern filter on. But that's going off the point of the actual video. The point of the video is this is a Mark IV, Mark V and light anti-gas respirator gas mask. Hopefully you can see how they've improved with each model or at least cut costs with each model. And um, hopefully it's answered the question on people who are interested in my British World War II military gas masks.